Hello, everybody, and welcome to, uh, well, thanks for joining us after the rolls. Uh, I am always, as your, am your host, wow, it's late, uh, Danny Allenson, and uh, we're going to go ahead and recap, or not recap, but go over a little bit of what we just experienced in the last session um, and talk about uh, some of the choices we made and stuff like that. So, Chris, why don't you take it away with the questions you have for us this week after the rolls? So let, let's quickly start by actually giving out XP, um, because I keep forgetting to do that in this such, such section of the stream. Uh, we'll receive 750 for roleplay this week, um, and I'm going to give both. Um, I was going to say Brynn, but uh, Brynn is going to get inspiration for use hey. in future sessions. So total XP should be seven. Seven one eight seven five. Yep, that's what I got. Let me just mark that down. So. All righty. Cool. So um, the theme got a little heavier this week. Uh, I figured we can talk about it a little bit. I kind of had to change some things around, introduce a character that I made up on the spot. And um, so I guess, first of all, we're looking at a very hedonistic culture, you know, a culture that is very much about their own pleasure. We saw that at the amusement war two weeks ago. Um, and we're seeing that the corrupt nature goes a little further than what we expected. Um, any thoughts on that? I think um, Philip had a very negative reaction to to it as well as the session went on. So what were you thinking about through Philip, uh, the actions that were, that you gave and then as a person? Oh, geez. Um, well, first, I'd like to make a point that I have never really played a character like Philip before. Um, he's probably the most, I guess, lawful good character I've honestly played. It's It's been rather interesting because I know as far as his, his story goes, he has never experienced anything remotely close to what he has seen for these past couple of sessions. So I figured it would make the most sense to show that even though Philip has had this this way of life that he would live, he would be someone who is extremely courteous, uh, comes across, tries to come across as a, a uh, more, I guess, civilized person than the other orc counterparts. And taking also his beliefs that are rooted in the religion that he that he pursues. I felt like it would make the most sense if a lot of that kind of got thrown out of whack just because of how jarring of an experience he's had. So I I I had Philip act this way because I I thought it would make the most sense. Uh, for example, he was pretty surprised when Nara kind of just, you know, <laughs> got him into the bar and with the whole unlocking it going in. So at that point, he knew it wouldn't be the best way to deal with the situation by, you know, approaching the people that lived there. So he kind of just decided to sneak out and make it seem like he was never there. But the reason why he went straight to the authorities was because he, that's kind of, who he is as a person. He's very straightforward, very honest. And um, unfortunately, things like that get people into trouble. And Philip is this kind of person. So kind of trying to behave that way while experiencing all of this really weird stuff that he's just seeing now. I felt like it would make a lot of sense for him to be rather, how do I put this, disjunct in his behavior. It was, it was, a bit more complicated than I expected. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I, I, I don't feel good about writing this session when I was thinking about it and, you know, what I wanted to do with our arc theme. And it was very difficult. Uh, but we do have this arc theme of redemption and we have a lot of things that we need to redeem. So I wanted to talk to sites and about Zarius and sort of this chapter is designed for Zarius. I had, had him have a conversation with Obadiah. Um, how do you think the theme of redemption affects the arc through Zarius' eyes as well as redeeming the culture that he is currently visiting that's not very good, nice. I'm getting tired. Sorry. Right. Hopefully that's kind of clear. I think so. Um, and please let me know if I do not answer this correctly. Um, in terms of what I spoke with, yeah, English, um, in terms of my conversation with Obadiah and his thoughts that he gave me, it, and in terms of my character and doing the right things for the wrong reason, I think is what it is. Or no, it might, it's the doing other way. Doing the wrong around. things for the doing right Doing the reason. wrong things for the right reason. Yeah. So doing the wrong things for the right reason. Um, I feel like this specific session fits in well with my overall character theme. Um, in that I did a lot of things that would be considered lawfully good, quote unquote. Um, but on the other hand, he was, he really wants to, Zarius really wants to take care of this situation that we've encountered today. Um, which probably will involve some wrong things that happen. Killings, burning places down, so maybe something like that. Um, and I think he will be more than okay with doing those things to help those children and to help those people that are affected by uh, said situation. Um, and I feel like overall as Zarius would perceive it, he would like to just go along with the rest of the party, but um as the quote unquote like leading the storyline per se of uh, which I which he is doing in this chapter um, he sometimes just has to make decisions that he feels are right rather than rather than going and looking at his conscience and saying that's not morally what I should be doing, but I have to do it anyways. He doesn't go through those necessarily stages per se and just goes straight to the, okay, this is what we got to do. Let's go do it sort of thing. Makes sense. Um, Danny Allenson. So we set up this scene, which I think the scene was specifically designed for Brain because Brain understands T playing I don't want to say anatomy, but life cycles, culture, culture, uh, I, yeah, biology, ge ge genealogy. Sure. Um, so I I wrote in this scene specifically for Bryn, so Bryn could react. Um, and honestly, I thought Bryn was gonna jump in and just wreak havoc, uh, <laughs> but you know, obviously, you made the choice to stay back and talk to Yvette 
which was Yvette was an interesting choice of a person to talk to. Uh, but what were your thoughts revolving that decision and eventually talking to Yvette? Um, the initial thought was was almost I would say I don't think that Bryn was thinking about the lack of other races at all. I think what her mind was was mostly um, considering about this place was, you know, the torture that she saw, which she thought was terrible, um, it, and then just kind of the the backwards notion of how these two men of power um, in this town are the ones who are in charge of this torture as entertainment almost. So I think that's what was racking up in her mind more so than the fact that there weren't other races around. So when she saw that, um, especially given the context of them already running away from guards, I don't think it clicked immediately for her uh, what was going on. Um, she knew that something probably terrible was about to happen, but didn't exactly know how to react to that situation. Um, and then when it got to her being kind of alone with her thoughts during her own watch, that's when that's when she really started thinking. I o almost I would say she she thought I did the wrong thing by by running away from that situation. And um, the reason I would say that she talked to Yvette about it is because one Yvette was there. Um, she didn't want to disturb anybody else. Um, Yvette was already waking up. Um, and the other part of it would be she kind of knows Yvette as a, a semi-heroic figure, I would say. Um, so to bounce off that those thoughts of, did you see what happened? I should have done something. Um, she She puts some stock into what Yvette would have to say in that situation. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah, it was interesting that I had to do that scene from the perception of Yvette. Because, you know, Yvette, uh, in, in this scenario, she's a DM PC, um, where she's just kind of there. I don't want her necessarily to take the spotlight. But in this case, it, it was kind of necess necessary um, to do so. It was, it was an interesting choice, and I thought it brought out a really interesting scene and it's forcing me to advance Yvette's character a little sooner than I was planning. Uh, I, I think that Yvette and Bryn are very very similar in a lot of ways. I think they're way different in a ton of ways but I think they're they're both similar in the way that they they do care um, but they're the way that they process that information is a little bit different. Um, and I, I already think that Bryn kind of recognizes that. And so sh that's, that's why she puts stock into um, Yvette's opinion almost in that moment. And um, it, it was good to see that Yvette was like all action. And that's, that's something that Bryn is typically. Um, so to have somebody there to kind of validate that and back it up uh, was good for Bryn. And uh, eventually it led them to uh, some new discoveries. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I almost scrapped the whole the whole storyline, honestly. Well, good thing we didn't. No. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think uh, Naroth was the most timid, even at the very end, where he was questioning why is should he even help, um, which is a fair thought process. Uh, but I want to see what. John's opinion on that interpretation was, if that makes sense. Those words made sense. What I think you're trying to ask is how I feel, um, how do I feel how Naroth is thinking about this whole situation? Yeah, like what made you make that character choice? So at this point, Naroth especially has seen a very one-sided view of this whole culture. Um, he's seen them, you know, intentionally trying to cause other people distress, um, as seen in the uh, amusement wars when 
Um, degradation didn't work on the one woman chess piece. Um, they asked, they, he, they commanded that they cut her hair, um, which showed me that they weren't tr just trying to um, do something degrading. They were trying to get a specific reaction out of the person of, well, just despair. Um, f other than that, Naroth has not seen any positive examples from this culture other than this one woman. Now, this is kind of influencing his view of this place. Um, so he is now suspicious of the good, quote-unquote, good people um, that we are being presented with because literally no one else he has met has been a good person as he sees it. Can I piggyback off of that for a sec? Sure. Um, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, up until, well, I'd say even until this point, we've seen the Naroth and Bryn's relationship as very friendly um, since their first meet, their first conversation together um, all the way through. Um, I think that we're going to start to see, um, see the tension start to come in now um, when it comes in to the idea of what is what is the right thing to do versus what is the good thing to do what do you think about that john i think i mean i don't know how your character is reacting to all this but i think it's going to be a personal struggle for naroth to do big picture little picture right now He's only seen bad examples of all these things, so Naroth wants to just get in here, in into the thing, do do what we need to do, and get out of here as quickly as possible. Uh, as for the right thing, Naroth probably isn't going to be as concerned, although he will be affected. Yeah, it's interesting because if you look at I say this as the only person who has done this, but if you look at everybody's backstory and how they react to things, they're all very, very, very different people. And I think part of the beauty of Dungeons and Dragons and you know character creation and the collaborative storytelling part is that you you have a bunch of different characters that sort of have to put up with each other. And powerful people have big personalities and. I would say all, all five of our main characters have pretty big personalities, and it's always interesting to see how they approach problems. We have lawful characters, and then we have literally the Prince of Thieves, and then you have people who wander around, uh, you know, trying to find new things, and then we have a person who's about to be a father, and uh, that relationship is very interesting. So... Uh, uh, Robert, it's weird not calling you sites. Robert, um, what do you think about the different personalities as they try to mesh them? Because it's sort of your responsibility to hopefully pull it all together. Right. Um, so, in terms of the different characters that we have in this part with Philip instead of Astor, um, I feel like it's a little easier for me to make decisions as a lawful good character. Um, maybe, okay, let me rephrase that. With the occasional uh, Lilith inside. So when Lilith is here, it's a little bit harder, I feel like, to make decisions because of her personality and the way Alan plays her. Um, her her personality is pretty dynamic. Uh, she she sits on the. I feel like she sits a little bit more on the neutral side, so she can go either way. Um, and with everyone put together, I feel like with her in it, it's a little harder to make decisions because she's got that, I want to do this bad part 
to it. But on the other hand, she can swing the other way and do the good part. Um, but I feel like right now with like today's session, um, I feel like uh, Bryn is a pretty, it's a fairly good character. It has, doesn't have any qualms, like any problems per se to the dark side, quote unquote. <laughs> um, uh, to the dark side. <laughs> Um, she, she's a person that I can trust, uh, is on my side, um, all the time as Zarius and, uh, with Philip, pretty much the same, pretty much the same way in terms of thought process. Um, he's going to always be on the good side, um, wanting to make the right decisions, um, even if it means bad consequences, as we saw today. Um, and with Naroth, it's a little bit different since he's the Prince of Thieves. Um, it, I feel like with him, it's much harder to... He, Naroth is very, uh, has a very dynamic personality in that he... Jonathan plays him very well in terms of the fact that yes, he plays him. This is my role and this is how I my thought presses is on him per se. That's how I feel like that's how Jonathan plays him. Um in terms of Prince of Thieves. I'm I'm just gonna put that as kind of his personality, Prince of Thieves. He's got a Prince of Thieves personality. <laughs> um Thanks. Just just for the hour that it is and <laughs> everything. Um <laughs> trying not to come up with another word for it uh but uh having to balance out all that out um i feel like right now it's pretty easy to make decisions because i feel like most of us sit on the good side of things um i don't necessarily discount uh narla's opinion because he's very well spoken and says what needs to be said and does a very good job at doing it um and his his opinion makes it hard sometimes to make decisions, which is good for a leader. Um, but um, in terms of just the overall party, um, personality-wise, I feel like we sit on the good side of things right now, um, which I think makes it a little easier for me to make decisions um, for the party because I know where most of them would like to go compared to um, sometimes when we have uh, Astor put in there along with Lilith. Uh, we sit... <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry, what? Kai. Oh. Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, go ahead, Robert. Anyways, um, with those two uh, people in the party, when we have them here, uh, it's a lot more on the neutral side of things. Um, so my thought process of thinking about how how do I go about this changes complete, uh, like a whole lot more when it comes to Astor and Lilith being in the party. And then previously when we had Kai, it's just like I don't trust him at all. Um, but yeah, that's that. I rambled for a while, but sorry. <laughs> that's that's pretty You're much good. my no worries. That's if pretty I much could... the answer to my question to answer your question i think cool if i can piggyback on that i think we noticed that uh, there was kind of a balance issue in the party uh just this session where we saw uh zarius come in and instantly say you know instantly come up with a you know the line about him bleeding um and trying to basically uh, deceive them into helping which is a notable shift from the from the classic zarius you know I speak the truth. We all do good things. Typical right, right. behavior. Yeah. Um, and that's also me as a player trying to incorporate the doing the wrong things for the right reason, I think, sort of mentality and trying to do better at that compared to previous sessions when I haven't done as good with that. Yeah, and, and you're doing really well with that theme, and I'm glad that we found that a good theme for Zarius. 
Yeah. It took a little while. But um yeah, it took a while. Um that that's all I got. Do you have any questions for us, Danny? Um sure, I have a qu question for you, Chris. Uh -oh. How do you think that the the experiences that these characters have gone through have affected that the way that they handle situations. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a difficult question for this time of morning. Um, <laughs> excuses. So, for one, we'll state that Brent, Philip, and Philip don't have the same experience as the rest of the party. So I think this answer is going to focus more on Zarius and Naroth. And yeah. Naroth. Um, when we dealt with the Wounded King and Kai betraying the party, what we saw is we saw both of them... I don't want to say blindly trust them, because there was a certain degree of questioning, but they pretty... They, they followed Kai. Uh, and as we enter into this culture, we see both of them questioning things more. Like, there is a certain uncertainty in their actions. There's more talking about it. There's more arguing about, you know, should we even touch this problem or what should we do? And it's interesting how we have a tonal shift, especially since, you know, Kai was quote-unquote, the party leader. The tonal shift between having a definitive direction, which was go to the tower, get all the jade, you know, to not having a clear answer, it, it creates a very interesting tonal shift in the story. Anybody else have, uh, have some ideas about that? Yeah, I think... Um... In terms of like Chris mentioning the just tonal shift, uh, and I, I would I just want to like say just I want I completely agree with what he said in terms of we're questioning a whole lot more uh, what is happening and what we're experiencing, and as a player per se, um, it people and a player as well as a character people base their actions on past experiences wait a lot of times and so i think what we're trying to do is trying to weed out any possibility that we could be wrong with what has happened previously and try and make sure that we are doing everything the correct way which we obviously don't have no clue whether it's actually the right thing to be doing or not sure um i i was thinking something i noticed about naroth specifically and john i'll i'll ask you a question at the end of this um it seems to me that naroth is a lot more goals driven than he used to be um he certainly had goals before um most of them were personal uh but now he he seems to have clicked with um this idea that there is a larger goal that he needs to complete basically or or always be striving towards and um furthermore how's the best way to put this well i'll say this uh john do you think that um the effects of the tower and um specifically there was a moment this wasn't broadcasted but there was a moment where um kai who eventually betrayed the party but actually sat Naroth down and said it doesn't matter what you tell a person as long as you get what you want out of them do you think that um this is something that Naroth has taken to heart or almost pushed to the side yet still kind of kept that um almost bigger picture um mentality goals oriented uh, mentality uh, from Kai what do, what do you think uh, how do you think that that whole situation has affected Naroth with, with this in mind? Well, um, I'm going to say that Kai definitely changed Naroth for better or for worse. So when he basically said, sat Naroth down and says, this specific issue doesn't matter. The fact that we get what we want matters. That has definitely 
stuck with Neroth. Um, and after seeing that Kai betrayed them and basically used the party that way, Neroth is definitely seeing this, classifying that kind of action as a personal, a way to complete a goal with, while at the same time alienated the, alienating the people that you're with. So I think he has learned from that in both a good and bad way. He's learned that um, he won't do that with people he actually cares about. But I think when he starts to get a little bit of more influence over people, that might be one of the tactics he uses because he's seen how effective it is firsthand. Awesome. Uh, Chris, do you have any more questions for the rest of us? Uh, I think that's good on my end for Alrighty, well, thank you everybody for joining us for uh, this little period after the rolls. Again, we do stream every Monday night at 9 p.m. Pacific, but we also upload everything to YouTube. So if you, if you miss anything, you want to check back later, find us on our YouTube channel. It's Power Level Podcasts, and you'll be able to see all of the past sessions there. Thank you so much for joining us once again, and we will see you next week after the rolls.